and welcome back to SEMA's podcast, Y'all Ready for This, where we talk about all things emergency preparedness to make sure that you and your family are ready for any type of natural or man-made disaster right here in Chatham County. This week, we are blessed to be back with two fabulous people and a brand new person. The first is Seth Sawyer, who works for the Chatham Emergency Management Agency with me. He is our head planner. And with us today, we have the Chelsea Kelsey duo again, Kelsey with the American Red Cross. Kelsey brings a friend today who is a sheltering guru and just all around awesome volunteer and person. And that is Mr. Bob Sheldon. All of you, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Welcome, glad to be here. Well, let's, you know, I kind of already spoiled it a little bit when I introduced Bob, uh, but today you guys, we are gonna be talking about sheltering. Yes, we have to bring the American Red Cross in when we're talking about sheltering because they are, you know, lo and behold, the sheltering gurus for the entire country. So we had to bring them in to talk about what it's like to stay in a shelter. So we've got a couple of questions. We're going to have an open and honest conversation about what that looks like, because if we have a hurricane evacuation, if we have something in our community that we have to open a shelter, that's going to be a worst case scenario for our residents. So we want to be open and honest so that they can prepare and everybody can prepare for what that's going to actually look like. So let's start off with the very first question of what is it like to stay in a Red Cross shelter? Well, it's always an adventure. I'm sure Bob can attest to that. Um, he certainly has more experience as far as actually staying in the shelters and working in client shelters. Um, we provide the typical things you might expect. So cots to make sure that people can sleep, um, locations so that you know families can kind of form little pods with themselves in the main shelter area. Um, we will also provide meals, um, typically hot meals um, for a not quite an evacuation shelter. Evacuation shelters and local shelters look a little bit different. So a re-entry shelter here in Chatham will probably look very different than an evacuation shelter if everybody heads off to Macon. Um, but we'll also serve meals in those shelters as well. Yeah, just let me uh, give a little part here. Uh, an evacuation shelter, if we had a hurricane coming at the coast and Chatham evacuated, um, basically, uh, it will be, uh, everybody might not have cots. Um, we will give the cots to um, the older uh, people or younger people. Um, it, is may, it is meant to be a place that he, uh, we make the clients safe and we get them out of the hurricane zone. Uh, like Kelsey said, we do feed them. Um, it's a little bit different than when you shift into um, a re-entry or a long, what we call long-term shelter because then everybody has a little more room, a little more, uh, they all have cots, blankets, uh, that type of stuff. So a little bit different between evacuation and, um, and uh, re-entry or long-term shelters. Awesome. Thanks, so, Bob. Bob, that actually leads into one of the questions I had. So well, what, what should people bring with them if their plan is to evacuate to a Red Cross shelter? Um, if they're coming from a, uh, on an evacuation shelter, let's just uh, go that way. Um, we would ask them to bring um, any medications, especially if they, if they are taking medications currently, uh, bring those if they are getting low on that medication if they can bring a um, copy of their prescription or, or um, call for that, because we can provide medications in our shelters, but it makes it a lot easier if we have the, if we have the um, uh, original prescription. Um, you can bring, uh, we don't want you to bring eight or nine suitcases, bring what might, some, might make you comfortable. Um, if you want a pillow, bring a pillow. We will provide uh, uh, blankets and, and stuff like that. Um, if you have children with you, you might bring one favorite toy for the children uh, to have something to do. Um, a deck of cards is always good. Anything that you need for, that you would normally use at home, we will provide um, uh, toiletries, 
um, at the shelters, toothbrushes and toothpaste. If you have certain kinds you use or you have certain requirements for something such as dentures, uh, we ask you to bring those uh, and then bring a, a change of clothes. Um, I will tell you that shelters, even in the middle of the summer, could become a little bit chilly at night because of the air conditioning uh, in a large area. So you might want to, you might not think you need to, but in even in August in Georgia, you might want to bring a light sweater or something like that just in case to, to use at night when the, when the temperatures go down. But other than that, just bring what you need. Um, if you have important uh, papers or you need uh, identification, uh, I'd bring that too. Um, don't bring a lot of money or jewelry or anything like that because we don't really have any place to, to store that type of stuff. Um, so do not bring um, weapons of any kind because we don't allow those in. Um, so uh, that kind of stuff would either have to stay in your car or, or leave it at home when you come. That's about it. So Bob, you mentioned it just a little bit, but I'd love for you to go back and clarify a little bit more. Um, and Kelsey, if you have anything to add, um, if someone forgets to bring their medication or they run out while they're at a Red Cross shelter, is there something that you all can do to help with that? Sure, we'll have, um, we have nurses at our shelters, Red Cross nurses. They may be the Red Cross uh, nurse or um, county health department or state health department. And they can secure um, medication, uh, common medications. I mean, if you're on um, uh, blood thinner or um, cholesterol medicine or something like that, and you forget it or you run out, we can, we can get that for you. Uh, normally, what we'll do is provide a, a week or two worth of medicines to get you through to where, when you get back home to your own doctor. Um, some of the, some of the, I mean, and it would be normal everyday medications that you would take, um, at home, uh, by yourself. Now, if you're, um, if you need IVs or something like that, um, then you would be at a, at a shelter that was run by the health departments or something like that, because we cannot do that in ours, but just normal everyday medicines, um, we can supply those for you. Now, if someone has specific needs like dietary constraints, uh, require special equipment or has a functional access need, how should they prepare to stay in a Red Cross shelter? And is there anything that they should do differently when they show up at a shelter? Kind of like Bob was saying, um, you know, we accept anybody into our shelters. Um, even those who aren't going to be vaccinated or can't be vaccinated for any reason, um, we won't require you to necessarily self-identify in that way either. Um, still bringing, you know, anything that you may need in order to function normally. So if you do have an access or functional need, our shelters are access and functional friendly. So we will still be able to provide like certain cots for people, you know, we have, we call them medical cots where they kind of sit up. So they're not the normal cots where you're laying flat down. Um, dietary needs, we do need to know about that. So that way we can provide food for you that isn't, is, you know, okay with your religion, okay with, you know, celiacs, any kind of disease you may have along with that. We just need to know those things. Um, we obviously, if you're a higher need person, if you have a caretaker, um, there's a registry that usually with the county that you would register for, and that would be a little bit different than a, going straight to a Red Cross shelter if you have those higher needs. Um, but anything that you would need really to live comfortably in your home, of course, like Bob said, don't bring nine suitcases, don't bring anything you can't afford to lose. Don't bring your diamond earrings and necklaces and things of that nature. You just never know. You could be the most vigilant person out there and somehow that stuff will still disappear from you. So just bring the, bring the necessities, but anything that you need to, to be comfortable and to make sure that your household is comfortable as well. 
that that's about what I I would say. Um, if you have, say, you have a child with autism, um, that would be a special need. If you will let us know that when you come in, we will try our best to maybe separate you from the larger crowd so that your child is not right in the middle of the of the shelter if he has or he or she has problems with with noise or stuff. Uh, of course, we allow. Um, uh, service animals for for people that are uh, uh, sight impaired. Um, a Red Cross shelter will allow only dogs and small ponies as a service uh, animal. Um, comfort animals, um, we, do, we are not allowing in the shelters right now. Um, if that is the case, we will try to, to get you with a person. Uh, we, we have co-located uh, pet shelters in most of our shelters. So um, that would do that. But um, somebody trying to bring in their comfort um, boa constrictor might might have a problem um, with that. But anybody with a service animal, a um, sight dog or anything like that is more than welcome. And we will, depending on your uh, request, we will either um, try to separate you from the giant crowds to, to keep the animal more comfortable. Or if you're fine with staying in the crowd, we'll let you stay in the crowd too. There's, there's no separation or we don't, we don't segregate uh, those people from, from the rest of the population. Awesome, thanks guys. So let's say, I'm gonna knock on everything wood in my office right now. But let's say there is an evacuation um, at some point and you've evacuated all of coastal Georgia and people are heading inland to inland counties in Georgia and they're headed to a Red Cross shelter. What from point A to B when they walk into a Red Cross shelter can they expect? Are they gonna immediately be given something to eat or do they have to register? What does that process look like? So typically um, the first thing that they will do is be asked to register. Um, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's just one sheet per family and they list the different family members on the sheet. Right. Um, unless there's a unless there's a medical need. Then there unless there's a medical need. Um, and then they will um, be given the comfort kits, any blankets that we have, you know, additional items that they may need that we can provide. Um, Bob did mention at the very beginning that we might not have cots for everybody right away. Um, that's because cots will have to come from all over the state. So if everybody's convening in Macon, we don't have over, you know, a million cots sitting in that area. So it will take some time to be able to provide those. Um, but cots will be given to those who need them the most to start. And once we start having those cots available, um, typically there is a snack table she says hesitantly, there's typically a snack table of some sort where people could grab water or grab a light little snack. And then meal times are around your typical meal times. So usually, you know, breakfast would be around seven or eight, dinner is around six or seven, and then lunch around noon to one. Um, and in those types of shelters, you might see hot food from the Red Cross. You might see hot food from other local organizations that will provide it. Um, you may also see some MREs, some uh, meals ready to eat. It just kind of depends on <laughs> what we're feeling like or what we're able to provide in that moment. But you will get fed as well. You're not expected to run out to McDonald's for every single meal. Right, and, and a lot of it will depend on how the evacuation orders are handled. I mean, if we all, if everybody waits until three minutes before the storm hits to leave, then it will be a lot more chaotic if, if people are given enough time to, to move in inland reasonably. Uh, we all know what the interstates and everything get like on, during an evacuation. Uh, we have pre-identified shelters in um, uh, Georgia now for the uh, coastal evacuations. So we know, the Red Cross knows where we'll be going. And we know where the people from Chatham County or, or, or some of the other counties um, will be coming. So we will be, um, unless something just pops up and really just shocks everybody, 
we'll be five or six days ahead of knowing where a storm is coming. So we'll be moving stuff as we can um, to, to the areas that we're gonna be having people come in. Now, admittedly, the first 24 hours, are you gonna get steak and lobsters for dinner? No. Um, are you gonna get uh, McDonald's cheeseburgers for a couple of meals? Possibly. Uh, you may get, um, um, like Kelsey said, an MRE or a, a meals ready to eat. We try not to give out those too many, but in an emergency, we'll get something there to eat. Um, we'll always have water and coffee and that kind of stuff. But um, it will be, a lot of it will be dependent on how the evacuations are handled. We've spent a lot of time dealing with the coastal country uh, counties and with GEMA. So I think we'll be better than we, we have been in the past about knowing where everybody is going which will take some of the load off, but um, yeah. um, put up with us or, or, or bend with us for the first 12 hours and things get better. I'll, I'll promise you that the first 12 hours may be a little, may be a little chaotic. So what do shelter residents do during the day? Do you plan any activities for children, children or adults to help them keep their mind off the storm? Kelsey, you want to take this one? I have a lot less experience being in person. Um, we will typically have kind of some children activities. Um, Red Cross, of course, we're not babysitters, so we don't anticipate you leaving your kids unsupervised with us. Um, but we will be able to provide some puzzles, maybe some books or games or something like that so that the kids can do something. Um, we do recommend that the adults bring something along like a book or, or something that they can do as well. Um, they're free to leave the shelter during the day. If they're not coming back, we do need to know that. But if they're coming back in the evening, they are free to come and go as they please. We have a sign in and sign out process. But other than that, um, we don't have, you know, set activities of 7 a.m. We're going to do water aerobics and things like that. But we do provide some things so that you don't have to just be kind of sitting on your cot twiddling your thumbs all day either. We will have a, um, I mean, we'll, uh, we'll have a TV room um, away from the dormitory so that um, people that want to watch the news 24 hours a day or the weather 24 hours a day can. Um, uh, I think most of them quickly get tired of that. Um, we, we will ask, um, like Kelsey said, we don't have regimented times to do stuff. Um, we will try to get donations. And a lot of times we will get donations from local merchants uh, um, for games and, and um, you know, soccer balls and something like that, that we will try to have an outdoor uh, activity for our area for that is uh, fenced for uh, children. Um, but we, like Kelsey said, don't just send your kids out there by themselves. Um, now, knowing that um, the Red Cross is, if we evacuate a half a million people from the coast, which would be probably what we would do if, if a large storm was coming. Um, the Red Cross isn't that big. So we will have limited numbers of people in our shelters. So one of the things that people can do in the shelters is sign up to help us maintain the shelters. And um, a lot of our work, uh, handing out food maybe, or, or cleaning up after meals or um, emptying trash cans or just stuff like that, um, you know, we ask for volunteers from the, from the population, general population, because in all honesty, we just will not have the people to do that kind of work. And I have, it, it sounds kind of strange, but I've noticed this in most of the shelters I work in. After you've been in a shelter for about two days or a day, uh, everybody in, their, in the world has a routine, whether you think you do or not. And when that routine is ripped away and you're put in a shelter, uh, you start looking for things to do. And, and cleaning a table gives people a, um, a, a purpose or, or something to do. So in a lot of cases, we have to ration out the work because we, we have more people sign up than to do. But uh, that's one of the things they can do. Uh, they can volunteer to... Um, 
uh, read to people or or stuff like that that um, some of our older population may not be able to read, but you know they're there, they're worried, they don't have anything to do. So we we may ask a teenager if they would read a book or or an adult read a book to that group or or anything like that. Um, there's not a lot of planned because hopefully you will not be in a shelter that long, especially if it is a an evacuation shelter. Um, hopefully you'll be there for, you know, three to four days max. Um, if you are in a long-term shelter, then yes, things change a little bit. We, we will have more TVs, we'll have more um, uh, situations, we'll have uh, churches usually that will volunteer for Sunday services and, and that type of stuff to take people places. So uh, it all depends a lot on on uh, the duration of the shelter and what you feel like doing. Awesome, thanks guys. So as we're getting ready to wrap up, is there anything else that our listeners should know about staying in a Red Cross shelter? Or Bob, do you have any stories that you would like to share about staying in a shelter that you think would be pertinent for our listeners? Before Bob jumps in, I do wanna say, <laughs> Right now, um, even if people are evacuated or e vaccinated, that's the word I wanted, we are still requiring masks for all of our clients and our Red Cross workforce. Doesn't matter if you're vaccinated or not, we are asking that you wear a mask. If you forget a mask, we will be able to provide some for you. Um, like Bob mentioned, uh, an evacuation shelter is typically about a 72-ish hour ordeal. It's about three or four days, um, and hopefully we can then focus on the re-entry piece. And with that, evacuation shelters are typically going to be a little bit tighter in space. Um, I'm not talking packed in like sardines, so standing room only, but they are going to be a little bit closer together than you would see in a long-term shelter. A long-term shelter, you have a little bit more room to spread out. So keep that in mind. Again, bring going back to that, don't bring eight suitcases with you. And even in a long-term shelter, you aren't going to need that kind of stuff. Um, if you are local and able to back into your home and salvage whatever you can or maybe your home just doesn't have power and you have to stay in a shelter you don't have to continuously you know you can go home and bring additional things or swap out your clothes or whatever you may need you don't need to bring your entire you know house with you to any sort of red cross shelter we won't have the space for that at all so bob did you think of any stories in the meantime <laughs> Uh, well, I could think of a lot of stories. <laughs> I, don't, I won't scare anybody. Let me put it that way. Um, most of the shelters that I have worked um, have been um, decent. I mean, yeah, nobody that stays in a shelter at a Red Cross is there because they want to be. Um, we're not the Hilton. Um, we're not even the Red Roof. Um, but we will provide you a safe a location and, and food. Um, one of the things that a lot of it is, is determined by the people that are there. You will, you need to go, know going in, you will be with people that uh, will be across all demographics and, and um, ages and um, uh, all walks of life. Right, all walks right. Of life. And, and you will be um, um, close but uh, you may be in, in an area that with people that don't speak English or that or don't speak English as a, as a first language. We will have translators. Uh, a lot of times we use the, the children for that because they usually speak both languages. So a lot of it is what you make of it. If you come into it uh, with the idea of making the best you can and, and, and it being a uh, situation that nobody wants to be in and we know that um, and we'll get through it together and go from there uh, they can be they can be pretty decent um, if you come in with the fact that oh I'm stuck here and and I don't want to be here and I want to get out as quick as possible um, then you might have a little a little more trouble so um, again like I say it um, we ask for your forbearance your um your patience uh, 
yeah, your patience, your ability to get along and, um, um, and your willingness to help. And, and really we've done this for hundred years or so. Um, I've run shelters from anything from hurricane evacuations to, to earthquakes, to tornadoes. Um, a shelter is a shelter. Um, we will do the best we can uh, to make it comfortable uh, and, and we will be safe. Um, so other than that, a lot of it is up to, to the clients or to the people coming and um, bring what you need, uh, only what you need, and, and, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll be willing to uh, put in a little work to make it better. And that's, that's about the best story I can tell you. I, um, you know, I've been in shelters where, they, where the people in the shelters <clears throat> actually gave the Red Cross people um, roses when they left, which was kind of strange. And I've been in Red Cross shelters where they didn't say goodbye when they left either. So, you know, they wanted to get back out and go. And we understand that because mm -hmm. we want to go home the same as everybody else does. And a lot of our people from the, in the shelters will be from the affected areas. So they're in the same boat as the, uh, as the clients. They're, they're worried about their homes. They're worried about their families. You know, they're leaving their their families to come run these shelters. So, um, you know, it's basically just a big group of um, um, 50 to 250 to 500 of your closest friends for three days and make the best of it. And that's about all the best I can say. I like it, make the best of it. And I think that that's what you'd have to do when you're staying in a shelter or living in that environment. Well, thank you guys so much for this information. I hope that we never have to use it and that our community will never have to use it. But if we do, we're gonna be just a little bit more prepared. So thank you again, I really appreciate it. Listeners, be sure to tune in next week as we talk about how you can stay informed this hurricane season. Thanks so much, bye guys. Thank you. Thank you.